Thank you very much. Thank you, Holly. Um, so yeah, today you're going to be talking a bit about uh, why we use videos to talk about biodiversity. So what is EcoSapien? Well, we're a YouTube channel and we explore the importance of biodiversity. We have over 70 videos online and we look at subjects like big questions, big ecological questions, exploring uh, things like why biological records are important, which we made in conjunction with the FSC, Biolinks Project, uh, to smaller kind of eco-how videos, which are basic how-to videos of how you can contribute to biodiversity and supporting biodiversity. My name is David. I'm the producer, executive producer of EcoSapien. And I basically coordinate projects. So I'm in charge of making sure the videos get online. I do all the editing, um, most of the camera work and directing work as well. And I also present. Um, we're a team of five. Uh, most of us are biologists and we all specialize in a, a different area of wildlife biology. So why was EcoSapien started? Well, it all started off with a conversation between me and the co-founder, Phil Taylor, um, and we met up to chat about an idea. So we both graduate, graduated from university. We both did the same masters. And we didn't really keep in touch after that. We kind of drifted away. Um, we'd worked together on various projects during the, the masters. Um, and of course, like many people, we came out of the masters uh, into one of the thousands and thousands of jobs that are waiting for us in conservation. In reality, I was working as a part-time ecologist and Phil was busy writing and on a trip to Madagascar, exploring all the marvelous biodiversity down there. So I've been interested in filmmaking from a very early age. Uh, when in 2014, I got my first digital SLR that was capable of full HD video, I decided to take advantage of that equipment and go up north all the way to the most northern of the Orkney Islands to North Ronaldsay. And me and a friend worked on making a documentary all about the island. In the end, it was a three-part documentary looking at the natural history and the people on the island. And that was actually one of the very first videos that I uploaded to YouTube. In the meantime, Phil was busy exploring Madagascar, looking at all the amazing animals and plants that are down there. And during that time, he had his point and shoot camera and he filmed a lot of different bits and pieces down there, which he eventually came back and made a series of small nature documentaries all about Madagascar. And this is where our paths crossed again. I saw one of his videos on Facebook. It was around about the same time that I'd uploaded the first North Ronald Say documentary and I was watching them and saw how good he was at presenting and how good he was at storytelling. And it started giving me ideas. So the documentary was relatively successful that I uploaded and I basically wanted to continue making videos online and on YouTube. So I came up with the initial seed of the idea which was to make a YouTube channel that was completely based around conservation and ecology. And this is when I got in touch with Phil and came up and produced the idea to him. So there are a huge range of educational channels on YouTube exploring a vast array of subjects and topics. These can range from small one-man band style channels to large media publications uh, with whole teams who are dedicated to making YouTube videos. At the time of us starting to think about making the channel, there are quite a few out there. So I'm just gonna give a couple of examples of kind of what, where we got a bit of inspiration from. So Veritasium, is well was at least at the beginning a one-man band production produced by Derek Muller 
And he's a ca uh, Canadian science communicator, and he makes videos all about counterintuitive concepts in science with a particular focus on physics. Now, he has over 7 million subscribers at this point and 700 million views combined. Now, by contrast, there's big digital media companies like Vox who make a whole range of material online. And they actually have a dedicated team to producing YouTube videos. And these explore topics such as climate change and even deep dives into uh, musical theory. They have over 8 million subscribers and over 2 billion combined views. So we saw a gap in the market in 2014. There weren't any channels that had a particular focus on conservation science or ecology-based uh, subject matters. There were channels that had structured learning, and these included subjects in the ecological sciences, like Crash Course, for example. But these channels had a huge variety of other subjects. We knew we couldn't achieve those kind of level of uh, YouTube channel, but we thought if we focus, we could focus on a subject matter that was extremely important to us and it would be manageable. So we came up with a mission to show people why biodiversity is important and why it's essential to our everyday lives. And this formed the basis for the YouTube channel going forward. Now, we know that was a big task and we really didn't know where to start. So we were essentially going to be making miniature wildlife documentaries. And like many people in the UK, we'd watched plenty of BBC wildlife documentaries growing up. And they were certainly a source of influence, but we weren't deluded. We did know that we didn't have 20 million pounds to spare to make a big showcase cinematic piece. So we took a slightly different approach, a much smaller scale approach. This kind of roughly divides into four areas that we focused on. First of all, videos would be around about five minutes long. So very simply, the longer a video is, the more distracted people get as the video goes along. You're likely to lose about 20% of your YouTube audience in the first 15 to 25 seconds. So you really wanna grab people. Um, five minute videos, usually retain about 60 to 70% of your viewers, but this can really rapidly decline as video length increases. We also wanted to focus on hot topics in conservation and ecology, ones that would fit into our core mission as well. And we wanted to use as much original video footage as possible. We both had cameras capable of filming in full HD, we invested in better microphones to get good audio quality, which is one of the most important things about making a, a good looking video and a good sounding video. And in the end, we ended up using all our footage throughout these videos. We also wanted finally to capture a large demographic. So considering the 80% of 14 to 25 year olds in the US, for example, watch YouTube, and there are an awful lot of other people who watch YouTube as well. We had quite a large base that we wanted to cover. So the resulting content, we try to write to the level of an educated nine-year-old. So anybody can really access. And if they wanted to dive deeper into it, they could get in touch with us. So we launched the channel in late 2014 with a very awkward channel trailer and four videos. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to let Phil from the past tell you all about why bees are important. And this is one of our, well, this is the very first video that we uploaded. So just bear with me a second, I'm gonna transfer over. Okay, can everybody see that? Should be a green dot. Yeah, you can see that. Great. Okay, I'll get going then. Today, it's all about bees. Everyone loves bees, right? Well, not everyone, but most. 
And there's something comforting about seeing a bee buzz from flower to flower, a feeling that the universe is ticking away nicely in the background. But it's not all sunshine and lollipops, as you may have heard in the news. Bees are in trouble. Across the United States, honeybees are suffering from a mysterious condition known as colony collapse disorder, in which hives are found abandoned. And beyond the honeybee, evidence indicates declines in wild pollinators across both North America and Europe. The reason? Changes in agriculture. Wildflower meadows have been ploughed up, hedges have been ripped out to form bigger fields, pesticide use has massively increased, and humans have been trading bees around the world in tiny little boxes, causing the spread of disease. But why care? So, here, in no particular order, are my top five reasons why bees are important. One, food. It's not all about honey. Bees, both the wild ones and the ones we keep in hives, are critical for pollinating plants that produce a huge range of food, including blueberries, almonds, and beans. The global value of insect pollination is estimated at 153 billion euros every year. And while this figure includes contributions from, say, butterflies and beetles, most of the work is done by the bees. Still don't care? Commercially reared bumblebees are important pollinators of tomato plants. If the bees die out, these plants will have to be pollinated by hand using little vibrating wands, which is less fun than it sounds, and more expensive. Tomato growing could become unproductive. No tomatoes means no pizza, and a world without pizza is a sad and lonely place indeed. Two, biodiversity. Numerous creatures rely on bees for their own existence. Badgers will dig out the nest to feast on the juicy grubs. Bee eaters consume, well, you can probably guess what they consume. And a whole host of other creatures prey on or parasitize upon the bees, including the endangered oil beetle. Numerous wildflowers depend on bees for pollination. Take away the bees and there will be drastic consequences for both the plants and the animals that depend on them. The world will become a less colourful, less interesting place. 3. Bees fight crime. Not a joke. Bees have an excellent sense of smell. And in 2008, scientists developed a detector. Essentially, a box of bees trained to stick out their tongue if they caught a whiff of something dodgy, like explosives. An infrared sensor registers the movement in the bees' tongues and alerts security staff to the presence of danger. 4. Bees are watchdogs for environmental change. Or watch bees, if you're being picky. And speaking of picky, numerous bee species have extremely precise habitat requirements. And if that habitat undergoes a change, their populations will respond quickly. Now, this makes bees potentially good indicators of environmental disturbance, including climate change. One recent example is the arrival of the tree bumblebee in the UK in 2001 from France. The species has now spread to cover over half the country, but fortunately, it's not likely to have any negative impacts on native UK bees. 5. Ecosystem Services these are services to which bees contribute that go beyond just pollinating our food plants. Remember the wild plants pollinated by bees? Well, some of them will grow big and strong and soak up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, a process known as carbon sequestration, potentially offsetting human-caused emissions. Their roots might bind the soil together, preventing erosion, and slow the seepage of water through the ground helping to minimise floods. At present, no one's calculated the value of all these services, currently being provided for free, but as anyone who's ever stared through the window of a super expensive shop will know, just because there's no price tag doesn't mean something isn't extremely valuable. So, bees provide us with food, help maintain biodiversity, fight crime, act as indicators of environmental change and contribute to a whole load of ecosystem services. So the next time you order pizza, 
or enjoy a blueberry muffin. Spare a thought for the bees. Hi. Right. Online. There we go. David, while you're doing that, I'm just going to step in for a second. Yeah. But there's a lot of people mentioning video quality and things like that. Mm. If if those people haven't already, they should turn off their their outgoing videos because I could see the video fine, I could hear it fine. Um, so it's not a problem with it streaming out. It's a problem with it streaming into your computer. If you've got any file sharing things on your computer, as Holly said earlier, turn turn them off. So it's about closing down any use of internet, except, except this, if you can. Okay, should be back on the presentation. Yeah, I can see that. Right, okay. So that's actually one of our more popular videos. Uh, it's had time to grow, of course. It's on about 137,000 views at this point. So, as the channel started to develop and we got feedback, we started dividing videos into themes or playlists. These tended to focus on a particular subject, for example, taxonomy, uh, where we'd focus on a particular group of organisms or maybe invasive species where we'd look at invasive species from around the world. Our most popular playlist by far are the Eco House series, uh, which show you various tips on how to do wildlife gardening, uh, take part in citizen science projects. Um, and our most popular video of all time is how to make a bird feeder from a plastic bottle of all episodes. And that has about 700,000 views. So why did we choose YouTube? So a very short history of the, the platform. It was created in 2005 by George Kareem, Steve Chen, and Chad Hurley, um, who had worked at PayPal and had realized that there wasn't really a place to share videos online. So the platform quickly got momentum and Google bought it in 2006 for a tidy sum of $1.65 million. Um, in 2007, it launched in the UK with another eight countries. By 2009, we had the HD capability on the channel. Um, and by 2010, there were adverts, which are, of course, are very familiar today. And this is when people started to prolifically use YouTube. Some of the most popular YouTubers today started in this period because they could show gaming or vlogging online and create a revenue based on the adverts. Uh, the first video to hit a billion views was Gangnam Style in 2012. And since then, it's just increased in popularity. There are 5 billion videos watched every day. There are 1.3 billion viewers around the world and 300 hours of video are uploaded every single minute onto YouTube. It's also the second most popular chat, um, search engine in the world after Google. And it makes sense to host something that you're passionate about on such a popular place. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a large proportion of the demographic, which is between 14 and 25. And the fact is that this group prolifically uses YouTube as a source of information and news. Many millennials watch YouTube over terrestrial TV. And of course, geography is a big factor. You can reach a huge demographic all over the world. So, for example, with our channel, our biggest audience is in the US, which makes sense as YouTube is the most popular over there. And then that's followed by the UK and then by India. Now, India is an interesting one because they haven't really had popularity in YouTube for very long. Um, but as mobile data has become more and more accessible, it has rapidly increased. And there are 256 million users in India today. So online content is becoming more and more popular than ever. And the younger generation has become more accustomed to digital consumption. Uh, from an early age, children use YouTube and it's very much the norm uh, when using internet these days. 
So having educational content online can be very engaging and it can be very good in a long term as well. So we're dealing with a subject which by its very nature is long term and getting people, young people on board with ideas of conservation and environmental awareness is a winning result. Now, as a result of COVID-19, about 1.2 billion children have been taken out of the classroom. And this has led to a forced experiment where education has moved onto digital platforms. Um, the global pandemic has demonstrated that in some cases, technology can be very good for education. For example, when learning online, students tend to retain information about 25 to 60% more than in a traditional classroom environment. Uh, this is mainly due to students receiving information quicker and having less distractions. And of course, it's by all means not a replacement, but it does illustrate how powerful online video and online learning can be. So what's needed to create a YouTube channel? Well, YouTube has changed a lot over the years. So the very first video uploaders was Me at the Zoo, which was created by uh, one of the original creators of YouTube. It's not a very good video. It's only about 18 seconds long. It's pretty boring. And of course, most people notice from this screenshot, it's very low resolution, 320 by 240. It's improved a lot. Now we can film in 4K uh, and we have much, much better equipment. Equipment that would have been in the realms of professionals, but now we can access as consumers. For example, we started with a 60D camera and we've wor worked our way up to 4K cameras, drones, microphones, gimbals, and all sorts of tech that can help us create dynamic and interesting videos. Of course, that's quite an extreme example, and we do this quite a lot, but anybody can produce videos for YouTube. Even affordable entry-level cameras are suitable for the platform. So in about 2016, we started to slow down production of the channel. Uh, we had to put energy into our careers in ecology and education. So we basically had to pause the channel. It's a very time consuming um, endeavor. Uh, so after that, we, we did tend to learn a few lessons. First of all, videos going onto YouTube don't need to be perfect. First of all, you can take them off if you really need to. Also, you can address things in the comments section and you can add annotations after the fact after uploading the video. We also learned that having a really strong brand is very important. So we were lucky enough at the beginning to commit to a certain look and this did evolve over the years, but we stuck to the core style of presenting, filming and editing. And this has stayed the same throughout. And then of course, consistency, consistency in churning out videos, even if it's one video a month and instead of the odd video here and there, that's better. Creating a channel is a commitment, but if you're confident in your message and you set up a schedule, it is achievable. So where are we now? So we're entering a new phase for EcoSapien, uh, spurred on from an interest in the channel, people wanting to help. We decided to relaunch with an updated identity new presenters, volunteers, and a new big lineup of videos. So this is a good opportunity to show you the next video, which is all about the sturgeon of the Danube River. So just give me a second, I'm going to swap over. He's a guy called Eco Sapien. He has a, a brand. Okie dokie. This is Bratislava, capital of Slovakia. A vibrant and cultural hotspot for the
country. It shares something in common with another three European capitals. It's built on the banks of the mighty river Danube. Europe's second longest river is an international waterway, meandering its way through 10 European countries. But this episode isn't about the river, it's about what dwells within. The Danube is home to some of the world's largest freshwater fish. These fish are the sturgeons. Often described as living fossils, they haven't really changed for over 200 million years. Out of the 25 species found in rivers, lakes and coastal waters around the Northern Hemisphere, the River Danube is home to six of these species. And the river basin preserves some of the most important sturgeon populations in the world today. Because it flows through 10 countries, 83 million people live along the Danube's banks and they rely on it for food, agriculture, industry and trade. But humans have put huge pressures on sturgeon populations, not only in the Danube, but all over Europe. This is Thomas Friedrich from the Life Sturlet project in Austria. The decline of the sturgeons, it's, uh, we don't have to talk about the Danube here, we can actually talk about all over Europe, it's uh, nearly the same. And uh, there's two major drivers. One of them is overexploitation. And this overexploitation already took place in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century uh, because these fish were really easy to catch. They were really big, so they were really easy uh, source of protein for, for humans. And this overexploitation really led to, to putting the stocks on an extremely low level already within the 20th century. And then with the construction of uh, dams, hydropower plants. Uh, the migration barriers, the migration routes were lost and many populations were cut off their spawning grounds and they started to diminish. Other factors have come into play as well. Since the 16th century, people have been changing the natural course of the rivers for flood protection and navigation, which has had a profound negative effect on biodiversity in the river. But it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. Thomas oversees the Life Sturlet project, a conservation mission aiming to support a sustainable population of sturlets, the smallest species of the Danube sturgeons, and one that is teetering on the brink of extinction. To do this, they'll need to apply innovative methods for breeding the sterlets before releasing them. It's here within these rather inconspicuous shipping containers that the breeding process begins. These breeding pools provide a temporary home for sterlets at each life stage, from tiny eggs until they're big enough to release. The team will be targeting two free-flowing sections of the Austrian Danube in the Wachau and the Danube National Park regions. These areas are home to particularly diverse habitats, offering the greatest chance of sustaining populations of the sterlet for future generations. Even though the future may seem bleak for these living fossils, there clearly has been steady progress towards their recovery. The most important condition for success has been, and remains, joint cooperation, whether political, scientific or economic. When the habitat and the ecosystem is working fine for this species, it will work fine for the other species as well. They really act like a protecting umbrella over the other species and the ecosystem and as they're really big and really strange they're also easily used as flagships meaning you can really use them 
for public education, uh, public relations, and really tell people what is actually going on. If you want to find out more about the Live Sterlet project, as well as lots of extra info about these amazing fish, check out the links in the description below. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to see more from us, hit the subscribe button or let us know what your thoughts are in the comments. Right, I'll just get swapped over again. Those people that have lost sound, can they hear me now? Just. Just type, yeah, okay, okay, that's good. Um, I'm not sure what's causing that, but I'm glad to see that you can hear us again. And, and all of Eco Sapiens videos are available to watch on their YouTube channel, so you can find out the end of the story there. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Thanks, Kieran. All right, just bear with me a second. Okay. Yeah, so as Kieran said, we have got a lot of videos on there and that is one of many. So definitely encourage people to get on there and watch the videos, um, especially if you have a good internet connection and you can even view them on your TV, especially some of the modern ones. They're in a very high resolution and they do look quite nice now. Um, so I definitely encourage people to do that. So we've got a new team. Um, so of course, there's me and Phil. Uh, but we've got three, three new people on board. Uh, you heard Aaron there. Uh, he's our media creative and he basically writes. He creates a lot of our social videos and he presents on the channel. And he joined back in uh, the latter part of last year. And is one of the people who kind of spurred on the, the project to become what it is now, the relaunch. And we've also got Charlie. Uh, she's a presenter and the social media coordinator. Uh, we wanted to get Charlie on board because we wanted more representation on the channel. We needed a female voice. Um, I'm very, very happy to have her on board as well. And of course, we've got Alex, who has completely rebranded the channel, has completely redone the look of everything, and does all our animations as well. So, upcoming content. So, we simplified the playlists a bit. We've still got Eco How, which is popular as ever. We've now got profiles. So a lot of our videos have gone into the profiles, which are about the people, the animals, the organisms, and the ecosystems, which make up our biodiversity. And of course, the big question episodes, which deal with big ecological questions. And then finally, we've got our snapshot episodes. So this is the final video, I promise. Um, hopefully people can watch it. If you can't see it right now, you're going to have to wait a little bit because actually this is a premiere or everybody on here is going to see this before anybody else online. So I'm just going to get that going. So hopefully it works for people.
Right. So that's pretty much it. Um, as I said, if you want to view any of those videos, apart from that one, uh, you can go to the YouTube channel and you can of course go to the website as well, which has all our videos on. The one thing I wanted to say uh, just before we end, um, we rely on conservationists, professionals, uh, wildlife lovers to help us with making these videos. Uh, we often include interviews um, of people who are working on particular projects in our videos and we really appreciate all the help those people give us. Um, but we're always looking for more help. We're always looking for people who might want to tell a conservation story, who might want to highlight something. So if you do want us to make a video with you, uh, just get in touch. Go to the website, which you can see there. There's a contact form and just send us a message and we can take it from there. Uh, but apart from that, that's pretty much it. So thank you very, very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. Um, Yes, yeah, so as we were saying before, if you do have any questions, you can raise your hands virtually or uh, post in the chat as well. We'll keep an eye on that too. Okay, we've got a question from Lisa B asking, would a portable tripod be needed for iPhones and can you recommend any good ones, please? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the core uh, things that we picked up initially when making our videos was you had to stabilize your shots. So putting a camera of any kind on a tripod is a really good idea. Um, one thing I didn't really mention in the presentation is a lot of very modern smartphones, so iPhones and uh, other Android phones, are very capable of filming more basic videos um, so yes, I would recommend getting a tripod, uh, in terms of recommendations for one, get a good tripod, uh, legs, get the legs for the tripod and you can get various mounts, uh, that will clip on to, uh, any kind of phone. Um, even if it's a third party one of Amazon, but I'd recommend for the tripods, maybe Monfrotto is the, the one that we use. We're not sponsored, unfortunately. <laughs> Oh, thank you. And then we've got another question from Lou and Mike asking, what software do you use to edit your videos? Okay, so we use the Adobe Suite. Uh, so in terms of editing, we use Adobe Premiere. Um, in terms of doing our animations, we use Adobe After Effects. If there's anything particularly tricky that we're dealing with with sound, we use Adobe Audition. 
Um, and then in terms of all the branding and all the kind of design side of things, we're using InDesign, uh, Illustrator. Uh, so they're all part of the Adobe suite, which I believe you can get for a certain amount per month. Brilliant, thank you. Bear with me a second, I'm just reading through the chat. Okay, we've got a couple of questions. There's one from Comled01, the name's coming up as, uh, asking about key issues and principles that would help us effectively create short videos for our own purposes. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please, to clarify? Was that for? Sorry, was that mine? Yeah, yeah, yeah that was your one. Sorry, I didn't know oh, you. Were... Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's lovely work, Eco Sapiens, but I'm not going to be able to do that for my organisation. <laughs> and we are non profit, low budget. So I was really hoping to get some advice and tips and thinking about how we as individuals or working for small groups can effectively, effectively communicate our issues or our thing. So it's a bit, it's almost, that's in a way, that's what I thought this presentation was about. So it's a bit of a huge question at the end. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if you can just summarize some top tips in some way or point us to something. Of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's so obviously from, from our point of view, we, you know, for me in particular, it's my hobby or it started off as my hobby. So, you know, I'm going to put a lot of time and effort into trying to get the best shots and make the best video possible. Mm. Um, but I realize a lot of people who are working very hard in certain projects want to at least communicate some of the things that they're doing but they might not necessarily be primarily interested in making the videos but they see it's important like like yourself so in terms of getting started like like i said before a smartphone of any kind is a good starting point keeping that smartphone steady is also a good starting point it makes it look a lot pro more professional in terms of sound, I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, uh, sound is a really key part. It's 50% of your video. If you've got poor sound, it really does, even at a subconscious level, kind of put people off and think, oh, this doesn't, it looks good, but it doesn't sound very good. So I would invest in a good microphone. So for an iPhone, you can get a lapel mic that plugs directly into some of the older models of iPhones. Um, or even the newer ones with a, a converter. Um, it might be worth sending me an email, then I could suggest some equipment. That might okay. be a help. Um, okay. Alternatively, if you do want to make a video and you've got a message you want to get across, um, we're always looking for stories. So that might be another avenue that you could go down. Okay. Uh, I hope that's of help. Was that, was that <laughs> yes. a good answer to your question? It's a start. I think I'm going to have to good. do quite a bit of homework, I think. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No problem. No, thank you. Can I just add something to that, Dave? Yes, of I course. think I think something that you can get you can get from Eco Sapien as well is you can learn a lot just from watching what they've done in their videos and how they've done certain things. So I think the best way to steal ideas is to steal ideas <laughs> by watching what they've done and deciding what you like and what, what you don't like. Um, we, we know that I'm never going to learn drone operation and, and the technicalities of that. So I get exactly where you're coming from, but I think already just from watching those videos, there'll be things that you'll have picked up, you'll have picked up even if subconsciously. I mean, remember, we were in exactly the same position right at the beginning. We were looking at YouTube channels and see, basically doing our homework and seeing how do they make these videos. And YouTube's great. It has a huge community of people who even show you what type of equipment is great to use for a YouTube yeah. channel. So just look up, you know, great camera for YouTube or something like that. And there'll be plenty of people who are reviewing cameras or reviewing equipment that you could use. And yeah, pick up tips and, you know, how, how, how did they do that shot? You can work it out from the video. Um, so yeah, completely right, Kieran. Can I just 
jump in, um, for Comrade uh, One. Um, obviously, I use Adobe as well, so I use a lot of the same programs as you. Um, but I also find, and especially when I've started off, that there's a program called Wondershare Filmora, um, which you basically pay a yearly subscription from. And it's a very simpler version of Adobe. It is really, really simple to use. So you can put the video in, you can add text over the top and you can change the, the sounds and you can put multiple layers on, but it makes it so much simpler. So somebody who doesn't have the experience of working with Adobe can start with that. And the more you use it, you gradually be able to add slightly more stuff and play with it more. And in the end, you'll end up with videos that look just as good as if it was done on Adobe. Um, obviously, yeah. some of the higher technical stuff you need to go to Adobe for. But as a starting platform, it's really good and it makes things look pretty professional and it's really easy to use. Yeah, precisely. I mean, in terms of kind of working your way up that software, um, there, yeah, there are lots of much simpler packages out there. Um, and you know, if you really did get into it and you wanted to make more professional videos, they will give you the building blocks to work to towards using Premiere. Premiere itself, um, especially now, um, isn't too complicated, but it's certainly complicated enough for somebody who's never done it before. But again, I have to stress, I'm completely self-taught. So in terms of me first using a piece of editing software, um, I actually, the very first video I made was on Windows Movie Maker, which was very basic. But then the next step up was Premiere, and I went straight into it from there, made loads of mistakes, and just kept on working on it. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. Start with the simple software, work your way up. Well, thank you. And thank you, Donna, as well, for joining in on that one. Could you post um, the name of that in the chat, please, just for others who didn't quite catch it? Um, Already in there. Ah, Brill. I'm way higher up. Uh, so we've got another question that was asking, uh, can you recommend any good drones for a visual flyby of natural land? Okay, well, the drone that we use is a Mavic Pro, the first one. Um, that is relatively inexpensive now compared to other UAVs. Um, but I would certainly recommend just getting a small UAV. So the Mavic Pro is very small. It's this big, if you can see me now. Um, and it, when it folds up and then it just folds out. Um, and I've taken that to a lot of different places because it's so portable. So that's one of the, the top things I'd recommend with a drone is portability. Um, in terms of flying it, it's very easy to use because it has GPS lock and an altimeter. So it stays at the right height and it doesn't move in position. So you don't need to be on the controls. You can not touch any of the controls and it will just hover in the same place. Um, but a Mavic Pro is the first one I'd recommend because they're quite cheap now. Mavic Pro 2 is the new version. Um, they're both capable of 4K, so they look great. Um, there's a new Mavic Air 2 that's just come out, which I'm considering for my next drone. It does a lot of what the Mavic Pro does, and it's even smaller. And they're all made by DJI. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from tom asking how do you get from a brand new channel to getting your first 100 followers <laughs> you need to invest in advertising we've never invested in advertising mm. um so i mean by all means we're not a big channel uh so in actual fact we hit 9,000 subscribers today which was quite nice um and we're probably going to hit 10,000 in the next month or so um in terms of when we started we quite simply just shared as much as possible. Um, having a good social schedule and uh, plan is very, very important. Um, it's like making a feature length film. Half the time goes into the actual production of the video. The other half goes into the spreading it around on social media, the marketing essentially. Uh, so that, that will get you hopefully your first hundred and then 
technically, if you keep it consistent, the growth should be exponential from that point. Um, but as we found out when we stopped, it really did stop in terms of the amount of subscribers we were getting. Um, but yeah, that would be my main tip. Social media. Invest. Oh, thank you. Bear with me a second. I'm just reading through. We've got lots of questions on the go. That's all from Kieran. Kieran, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> it's not just me. Oh, he's frozen. Okay, maybe he... Just check he's still in. Okay, I'll ask his question for him then. Uh, Kieran is asking, do you approach other YouTube channels to add your videos to their playlists? Or do you approach organisations to embed them on their website where appropriate? Yes, good question. Um, a bit of both. Uh, we're taking the approaching other YouTube channels approach now. We didn't do that before. Um, so we're talking with other YouTubers who might be a lot more popular, you know, have like a hundred thousand subscribers, for example, and ones that share similar core values. So we're in the process right now of trying to set up a, uh, wildlife biology YouTube community, which there is a bit of a lack of that as well. They're all kind of sporadic, um, in terms of, uh, featuring, uh, them on other channels. I mean, we do approach conservation organizations and say look we want to make a video about these for example so i think you've got the bumblebee trust next week haven't you yeah yeah so we would approach the the bumblebee trust and say look we're making a video um about how to make a bumblebee home which consequently is going live tonight um, and we would say, you know, can we uh, get somebody on board to do an interview uh, and then do a bit of cross-pollination between the two of us and try and, and work out a, a strategy, essentially. Yeah, great, thank you. And we had another question from Lou and Mike. So they were asking about uh, the software you used before. So they're just wondering, are there any issues relating to the use of music? Is it okay to use any release music or are there uh, copyright issues? It's a very good point. So you might have noticed in the, the first video that I showed the B video, we had no music. And in the early days, we didn't really know. Um, we were very cautious. We didn't use any music. So it's, it's like it's like pictures. It works um, with attribution licenses, creative commons licenses. So you can have a creative commons non attribution license for certain music. It tends to be not as good quality. Uh, because you know a, a good producer of music knows their stuff is good and they're going to charge more money for it. What we use is a subscription service. So we use uh, Epidemic Sound, which I know the irony of the, uh, the, the name right now. Um, but in terms of uh, the service, it's very, very good. They have a very wide range of music. And as long as you maintain your subscription, so it's a commitment, you can use any music on there. Um, otherwise you're going to be paying per track and you're looking at 300 pounds per track, for example, which is prohibitively expensive. Yeah, that's mad. Um, we have another question from Karen asking if you use other platforms as well, such as Instagram for advertising. Yeah. So we just started using Instagram. So getting Charlie on board, she's really pushed the, uh, Instagram, uh, feed. Um, we put kind of mini trailers for each video onto Instagram. Uh, so definitely everybody follow us on Instagram as well as subscribing to the YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, in terms of other social media, we push them on all the major platforms. So we have quite a well-established Twitter account. That's that ticks along nicely. Facebook is a bit trickier. We've always found Facebook quite tricky. Um, but Instagram has a lot of value. So, um, yeah, having a good strategy again online is a, is a really good way of doing it. Um, but also we make uh, specific social videos for our social channels, which don't get shared to the main channel and are in a slightly different format. Um, so we kind of have sprouted out a little from the main channel, but everything points back to that main channel. Well, thank you. 
Um, yeah, we had someone just asking about where we're going to put this recording afterwards. So Sophie's posted that in the chat. So who was it? I think Carol asked that. The link's in the chat and we'll put this up uh, probably in a couple of days time. You'll be able to watch it back. Uh, um, bear with me. Okay, a question from Sarah. What are the economics of running your own channel? Do you cover your costs? Do you make money? Uh, we pretty much cover our costs. So there's always a, a very kind of um, basic income generated from advertising. Um, in terms of uh, the amount of money you really are going to start making good money when you have millions of subscribers. So at this point we are voluntary. We're just paying for the things that we need to make the video. So for example, the music, uh, paying for the website, things like that, or, you know, traveling to wherever we need to film. Um, sometimes we will get commissioned to make a video um, and that can obviously help a lot um, and then in the future we may consider approaching people that we can get to sponsor the channel as well so there's lots of different ways you can do it uh, but certainly at the beginning it's not a big money-making venture and that's certainly not why we set it up um, but it you know it helps to sustain the channel if you have a bit of income trickling in as a result yeah well thank you we've got a question from abigail as well just asking what's going on at the moment with social distancing how are you doing your interviews and everything so we're doing our interviews all over zoom um so we've got a video coming up uh, about lichen um so just before lockdown me and my partner we headed down to uh exmoor uh, on a little holiday took the opportunity down there to film some of the lichens um which it's very very good for um, and then needed an expert, so did a call out on Twitter and had a lichenologist who's based over in Washington State in the US. Um, so had, well, we've recorded the interview with her and she'll be integrated into the video. And the fact is that a lot of uh, big channels, for example, Vox that I mentioned in the presentation, they use Skype and Zoom interviews as the foundation for some of their videos. It's a good example of, you don't really need to do the top quality version. And especially in the current situation, it works very well, but that one of course is locality as well. We're not gonna fly all, all the way over to Seattle to film one person, which would be nice if we could, but we, we, we can't do that. Um, but yeah, that's how we're, we're solving it right now. Um. And then we've got a question from uh, Meg as well, asking, would you recommend starting a YouTube channel if you want to go into environmental education? Of course. I mean, you know, it's, first of all, it acts as a good place to basically say, this is me and look, look at all the amazing things I can do. Uh, so it's great to put on your CV. Uh, you know, you can do a show reel um, to show off all the, the various skills that you have. Um, if you are wanting to go into presenting, it's a perfect place to do it. So both Aaron and Charlie are aspiring presenters uh, and they have their own channels with their own show reels on there. Um, and so they work on their own stuff as well, as well as feeding into this, this channel. Yeah. Uh, Can I add something, Dave? Because yeah. me and Dave and Holly have worked together on videos uh, previously. So I've got four videos under my belt with Eco Sapien where they unfortunately did make me speak in them. <laughs> um, and the way that they sit on the Eco Sapien channel, but we have playlists on our channel that have those videos in. So you don't necessarily need to have your own channel to host your own videos, if that makes sense. If you were doing a video with Eco Sapien, um, it can be hosted on their channel. If you have your own, that's fine. It can be hosted on their chat, their channel, but also visible on yours. So it's worth noting that. And I don't know if Dave's looking for volunteers, but when somebody said about setting up their own channel, I've put a note in the comments there saying, you could always ask Ecoscaping if they need any help with anything. Yeah, I mean, we, we are looking for help all the time. Um, you know, we, it becomes quite a logistical nightmare trying to send out a video every week, for example. Uh, so 
we're looking for essentially a social media coordinator right now to volunteer. Um, Charlie deals with that right now, but we want her focus to be on filmmaking and presenting. So that might be something that somebody would be interested in. Um, we're having people contact us now all the time. So kind of camera people, operators, uh, so, but definitely get in touch and we can at least have a chat, um, kind of going to back to what you said there, Kieran, Charlie, for example, she is starting a playlist on her channel, which are all the videos that she voices or presents in on EcoSapien. Uh, so, and I'm sure she'll be going to other places and working with other people and putting those playlists on her channel as well. Okay, um, we've got a question oh, from Abigail again, asking, do you think Twitter is a must have for this, sort of getting your name out there? Yeah, I mean, Twitter, so we kind of treat our different social media platforms in different ways. They have different demographics. Um, Twitter tends to engage more with the scientific community, especially people, you know, when we put out a call out, we need, we, we want to make a video about dung beetles. Um, I had 10 scientists get back to me within an hour on that one. Um, so yeah, it's a must have if you, from our point of view, if you want to get contact with people uh, who are experts in that field, it might vary depending on what you want to do. Uh, Instagram is quite different. Instagram is, uh, of, by, of course, it's very visual, um, but it's a really good place to kind of get people hooked who might not necessarily be interested in biodiversity and conservation so they have different places i think but yeah do all of them <laughs> yeah okay i think we might make this our last question if anyone else has got any questions put your hand up we'll put it in the chat now otherwise this will be our last one um we've got a question from c Bernardini asking, have you ever made a tutorial on how to produce a short video? Good question. And in actual fact, I was talking to a camera operator the other day who wants to volunteer. And he said, I would love to make behind the scenes videos. And I said, yes, let's do that. So yeah, we, we want to, um, especially when um, it's, it would be, be good for people to see how we kind of take our approach and especially some of it's a lot more low tech than you might think. You just need to practice. Yeah. Okay. One more question from Chris asking, would it not make sense to have an um, environmental slash biodiversity mega channel on YouTube that everyone can post to? Well, this is the idea of the community. Um, maybe in the future, it's, it's a really good idea we could go that direction. Yeah, great stuff. I've got one last question, Holly. There you go, Kieran. Go. Dave, what is your number one tip for making your environmental education video viral? Oh my gosh. That's, that's Apart amazing. from working with the Earthworm Society. Apart from working with the Earthworm Society, it's having prolific social media sharing. Uh, because people won't see your video unless they're kind of it's right in front of them a lot of the subjects that we talk about people might not necessarily be searching for so we try as much as we can to include keywords or kind of buzzwords in the title so people might type in climate change and our videos in the back end of the video will be tagged with climate change uh, it might have a tentative connection, but that's, that's kind of a surefire way of getting people to start to watch your videos. Um, in the YouTube environment, as I said before, the most popular ones are the how to videos. And that's because people just type in how to make a bird feeder and our video pops up straight away. Uh, so it, it really depends on the type of video, I suppose. Great stuff. Right. Well, I think we'll call it the end now. So thank you so much for joining us today, David. I've definitely learned a lot anyway. I've got loads of notes written down. Hope everyone else enjoyed it as well. Um, yeah, so we'll say bye now and thank you for coming. You can unmute yourself to say bye as well. So I'm not 
chatting at a blank screen all the time. There we go. I can see some more faces. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>